you can see my uh, presentation here. Yes, yes. Great, well, thank you. First, um, I wanna thank the organization for inviting me. This is a whole new experience for me and really excited about, um, you know, just the VR environment and the community. And so I'm really honored to be among, you know, just unique creative individuals who are moving humanity into just a different way of being. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Alira Salman and I am the founder and principal investigator for Deep Space Predictive Research Group. And what we do is we develop behavioral technology that enables and empowers humans to manage themselves in harsh and isolated environments. And the environment that we're talking about today would be long-term space travel, um, looking at psychological safety, emotional regulation in that environment as a tool, and also obviously doing this in long-term space travel. And, you know, when you think of space and all that thing, we think it's long-term, but in terms of space, it's really tiny, but we're tiny people in the big universe, and it's just going to be a new journey for what we're going to do. Um, in addition to Deep Space Predictive, I'm also the Director of Innovation for the Mental Health Center of Denver, and I'm also the uh, Partner Director for the AI Institute at ILIF. So I think all these endeavors may sound disparate, but actually they have a lot of synergy in the work that I do and embracing all the differences in, in the work are all the differences that create a great product in the end. So, um, and talking about our work and really what we're talking about today is the long-term space travel. So we're here to ensure that team success is um, enabling the human crew members to become psychologically self-reliant. And that's the biggest uh, challenge that we have is one, helping them be comfortable with their emotional health, but also now managing it and managing the interaction between individual, you know, your, excuse me, with yourself, but also between individuals. So it's not just about survival of the vehicle and the mission, it's making sure that the humans in the mission are able to survive because we know with different um, events and types of environments, we think of war, that, that situation, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, those um, moments continue to live with individuals. So we want to make sure that they have as much, as I call psychological armor as they can and have all the tools they need to manage it. And one, as, as we've been living through uh, the coronavirus and pandemic is understanding what it is to be in an isolated environment and how to manage ourselves. We are all experiencing some of the things that these crew members and astronauts will experience as they go on this long-term space travel. We have a few advantages here on Earth, i.e. we can walk. That's a huge thing. But you know, just making sure that the psychology and their emotional health is just as important as their um, physical health, which they are, you know, um, aligned. So what we like to do is, you know, our solution is really the human in the loop. When we go talk to NASA, we went to a presentation, you know, one of the things they say, the human is a subsystem of the vehicle. The important thing is the vehicle. So now what we try to do is bring the human in the loop and say, it's just as important and has a lot more risk associated with it because you know, you have these highly trained individuals, highly intelligent, um, been trained to put their emotions aside in order to do their work, in order to do that. And you can do that for a while, but these long-term missions that we're going to embark on where we're going back to the moon permanently, which is gonna create a whole new culture, a whole new environment, we're going to Mars and Mars is a three-year mission four people, four to five people in um, a three-year mission, and all they have is themselves in a very small environment. And so as we continue to go further and further out, the next destination is Jupiter, you know, and we go interstellar from there. There's a lot of time that's going to be spent in getting to your destination as we do now. 
well, we used to, we go to work, we wake up five, five different steps, you know, and that's it. And you're, you're at work, whereas before we, we drove, now we're going to a place where to even get to your work, it's three years. So what does that look like? So what we want to do is in bringing human in the loop is utilize emotional regulation and external monitoring to provide countermeasures when a psychological breaking point occurs. So what we're trying to do is one, normalize the fact that we're all not perfect, that we do have challenges, that there might be a situation where you just can't go the next day, or it's, you, you get into a depressive state, an onset of a condition. And what we wanna do is acknowledge that yes, that is going to happen and it's okay, cause we got you. We have the tools to help you get through that um, situation and get through the other side and survive that other side. And that's really what we're trying to do is not suppress the situation or the idea that you have to be perfect, you have to be stoic in your emotions and just work through it. Because eventually it catches up to you. And when you have time by yourself or with a crew and the only, you don't have a lot of new stimuli in your environment, depression can happen or other things can happen. So um, we just have to acknowledge that and make sure that we're in the mix or that we have the tools to support people. So, you know, when we talk about the humans, you know, in the loop and the fact that there will be a psychological breakdown, there's all kinds of anecdotes. And if, I don't know if you have heard this, I know it was big news in the US when there was a research team that had been together for four years in Antarctica and all of a sudden found themselves in the middle of an attempted murder. And one, the, the situation that happened is one researcher stabbed another researcher. And it wasn't more like a defensive kind of stabbing. It was a, it was a situation where this individual tried to kill the other one by stabbing them in the heart. So it wasn't on the arm, leg or anything, in the heart. So you know that was a deliberate motive where that person had reached their edge. And the reason that they stabbed them was because they were spoiling books, the ends of books. For us here on earth, it's like, you know, we get annoyed with that, but it had come to the level where it had affected that individual so much that he was willing to commit murder to stop that situation. So luckily that's on earth. The person did not die who was stabbed, but you have to think, why did that person who was stabbed continue to engage in a behavior he knew would agitate the other person? And if the other person was so agitated that they were willing to commit murder, what were their psychological state? They didn't start that way, it evolved that way. And so we wanna say with what we wanna do at Deep Space Predictive is really say, we know this is gonna happen. Let's figure out what are some predictive, situ predictive um, situations and psychological and emotional states that might lead to that kind of situation and prevent it and prevent it or at least minimize. We would love to prevent, you know, prediction. We are all still humans and free will. But the other thing is, can we lower the impact of what that was? Instead of a stabbing, could it have been an argument? You know, where they still walked away and had a different level of understanding. So those are things that we're trying to do is use these tools to help make sure that we take care of the human that's in the loop of that, um, of these missions. So I wanna identify some key terms in our work. One is psychological safety, because when we have these tools in these situations, we wanna make sure that the person has privacy and psychological comfort, not only for themselves, but in the interaction with the group. When we talk about teams and our measurement, one of the things we focus on is that the team is the smallest unit of measure. There are individuals within the team, but we wanna say, how do we make sure that this team functions together? And if you don't have psychological safety within that team that you're comfortable enough to share 
or more importantly, be vulnerable, we have a problem because then you can't progress and get the tools that you need and do the things that you need to do to prevent situations like a stabbing. And when you're in space, there is no rescue. So the other part of that is understanding that once this group or crew goes to Mars, there is no quick rescue at all because you're out there. It's gonna take nine months to get where you're going. And then you have to wait. And I know this sounds like science fiction. You gotta wait till the planets realign in order to get back faster. So those are some different things um, that are part of this, this challenge. And then we talk about emotional regulation is understanding your emotions and your ability to identify and manage what your emotions are relative to the team and to the, yourself, the team and the situation. So we wanna get the tools that are necessary for that. And then finally, the other part of it is what is that psychological breaking point? It's a point where an individual, and I know I talked about the team, and the team can have a psychological breaking point as well, where they've reached a point where they can't effectively contribute to work efforts or maintain relationships. So if the group can't maintain a relationship, that team has, you know, um, has broken down. When we talk about, um, when we talk about the different individuals and the relationships between the individuals, that's also a point because as you know, in any family, if two people are fighting in a family, the whole family is in a fight because then you have to say, well, what is going to be my relationship to person A or my relationship to person B? So it's so important that we help the individual so that the team can also thrive. And that's what we're talking about as we go through the situation. So the mission that we're really uh, focusing on because of the, you know, we're actually going there is Mars. We are actually going to Mars. We are, when I say we, I say humanity. And the big challenge with that is, you know, in when we first started doing space exploration in a serious manner, you know, we were trying to make sure the machine worked. And that was the unknown, that was the unknown. Does the machine work? Can we get it to where it's going to go? Is it going to keep the people inside safe? And now the challenge when we're going to Mars is not the machine, it's the humans, it's the mind. How do we keep them healthy enough? Because we're savvy enough before when we went to Apollo and the early moon missions, and even on the International Space Station, those machines that they're in and the vehicles need a lot of management. There's a very heavy schedule to keep um, the maintenance around it. If you think about the International Space Station, it's been up there for over 20 years. I mean, how many of us own cars that are that old, let alone a space station? And so when we go to Mars, we've learned so much about vehicle maintenance and things like that, that those vehicles are a lot, um, there's a lot of self-sustainability where the people do not have to do as much management. So guess what? They have a lot of free time. And when humans have a lot of free time, we got to be able to fill that time in a way that they still feel productive and engaged. So when we talk about Mars, it's a three year round trip before crew members. And the important thing, and one that's a, one that a lot of people don't think about is that there's a 40 minute communication delay back to earth. One of the things that's kept us engaged in this isolation and in COVID is that we still can call a friend. We can still use technology to reach out. We can text, we can, you know, make a phone call. We can do Zoom when you're on. And that has, that helps keep people connected and grounded. When you're on a mission and you have a 40 minute delay to have a, con just to say hello, that's going to inhibit how we communicate, how we feel and making the effort to do that. It's a big hurdle. So communication is really a big part of the challenge that we have to do. And this picture that you see is um, really an interesting perspective that obviously none of us have had. Thank you for our rovers for getting this, but this is a picture of Earth from Mars. So when you see, when you think about astronauts and how they've gone up to the, you know, even in the shuttle, 
in the International Space Station and on the moon, Earth is like right there. That was our first view of we are other, or we are all, but we're also other. And in this space, this planet is like floating in space, it's real. When we go to Mars, we will not have that close connection. You see that dot in the sky and you're like, what is that dot compared to those other dots or looking at the sky? So space exploration provides this really unique and interesting challenge. And so we have to figure out ways to make that challenge manageable and survivable. So when we talk about emotional regulation and what we do with emotional regulation, um, at Deep Space Predictive, what we do is we baseline individuals' emotional state and how they run. There's no optimal, There's it's just how does person X, um, how do they manage themselves and is that compatible with the other individuals? We talk about performance management and how is it that this team now, we pick the best team, not just the best people. For the astronauts, you assume that they are the best people because they've selected to be an astronaut. But what are the who are the four people that get along the best? And they may not be what you expect. You don't, you know, the um, the effect, the alpha effect of putting all like type A personalities together does not make a good team. You have to have balance with that. And then finally, providing countermeasures for the, you know, once a situation has happened or in order to manage yourself so that a situation doesn't happen, those countermeasures are tools that we give to individuals to counter negative impact or negative feelings at that time. But what's interesting and the quotes that you see here is that we don't know what their psychological state is going to be because of these big effects that happen um, when you go into space. And most of the time it's positive. The, if you've ever heard of the overview effect where it really actually changes your cognitive processing when you understand kind of your place in the world. It's a profound, it's a profound effect of perspective and well-being. And that perspective is something that's been reported by almost every astronaut who's gone up into space. They see themselves as part of this bigger and more important part of being in the universe. And that's positive. But on the other hand, we'll also have this new experience where you have the earth out of view effect. So the overview effect says I'm part of this thing. I can see it's big and I know I'm a part of it. And now when you go to Mars, you have this opposite effect. It's like, where am I? Where am I a part of? And I, I am, this is another piece of evidence that I am not connected to the people I love. They're so far away that I can't, um, that I can't communicate with them. I don't even know what earth looks like given the pictures that I've had before. So those are some really interesting um, different things that are going to impact how an individual will react when they get into space. And so when we provide these emotional regulation tools, we have to accommodate for another, a new and interesting baseline in their thought process and how they experience things because we don't know. And what we do, the tool that we use is using a cardiovagal tone to monitor and understand how individuals actually react and what their physical reaction is. And then on top of that, so we can do that here on earth and create all these great models and predictability and understanding how people work. Soon as you go into space, that baseline changes. And so how do you start to manage that baseline on um, in a new context? And that's what's important because that baseline is going to be the basis for our predictive modeling. But I'm gonna take us back a little bit and talk about emotional, um, how we identify and understand emotional um, regulation and the problem solving. Because the ultimate goal of making sure that people are engaged and that they are um, healthy is that they continue to do their work, that they continue to 
solve problems and basically make an effort to do their everyday work. Because what's gonna happen in space, because these vehicles are pretty much self-sustainable and don't need a lot of maintenance, things like that, you do, when something comes up that you have to do outside of your regular maintenance, is problem solving. So what we've decided to do is use um, emotional regulation uh, as a way or the emotional regulation of the triangulation model as a way to monitor and understand how individuals individuals work and how that works within each relationship of the team. So we would have, um, so the, the model is by Gilbert and the idea is that it's a triangulation model where you have a threat system, a drive system and a soothing system. And each of those obviously has a part of what, um, how a person sees the world and how they, what their main drivers are, but it also gives us a way to start to manage and understand how that person interacts with the next person, what they perceive as a threat. So um, object, we can figure out what objective measurements are to measure that. And again, like I said before, we're using the CVT model of cardiovagal tone and monitoring that as, a, as an indicator of someone's personal, um, their personal, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for, is uh, their personal model of adaptation. So when we do that, we rely not only on self-reporting, but the objective measurements of that tool. And the data range can be gathered passively or with a pattern of um, interaction of those being correlated to outcome measures for problem solving and team cohesion. So this is the tool and the base model that we use for that. The other part and the third part of what we do is making sure that individuals have psychological safety. And again, as I said earlier, that psychological safety is important for engagement, being vulnerable and being open enough to address issues when they do come up. So you have to create that safe space. Part of that is through privacy, having a private space to go into that's all yours in, um, in the vehicles that are going, and I'll show you that a little bit later, they're not, there's not a lot of room. There's going to be some modules, but you're only five to 10 steps away from anybody at any time, just because of the size of the vehicles that we're starting to develop now. And what's interesting is um, when we watch science fiction shows, you know, the big thing that you see is that one, people are walking, which means there's gravity. Two, those, those ships are huge. If you really put them to scale, they're, they're immense. And to be able to build something of that scale, we're just not there yet. We're working on it, but we're not there. So what we do is we have these modules and capsules with attachments to them. So we create opportunities for privacy. On the International Space Station, your private space is about as big as um, just a, a very small closet that a human can fit in that floats because you don't know what's up or down. You're in a, um, you're in a, um, like a sleeping bag that floats and you're in the size of a very small closet. So that privacy is very limited, but it's also very intimate because it's just you. But in order to create that safety, you need to have a place that's your own that's, that's, that's private and intimate. And then another way to do that in expanding is to use virtual reality. So one thing that we do is we try to bring in virtual reality in two different um, modalities and use cases in that virtual reality. <clears throat> and the first place, the first way we use, <coughs> use it is to assess team cohesion. So all those other steps of um, emotional regulation, understanding and baselining based on that triangulation model uh, to understand who, how you as an individual work, how you'll work with the other three members in identifying the team. And then we also use uh, a gaming experience to do a task for those individuals to assess and manage and monitor 
interpersonal relationships. So we use um, the game that we use is Star Trek uh, Bridge Crew because it's not an individual performance game. It's you either win as a team or you lose as a team. You have a little bit of feedback on you know, certain tasks that certain roles have, but overall you either met the mission or you didn't. So what we do is we train our uh, crew members on this game and then we measure through the, um, a, through the emotional triangulation model, we monitor how they work and how they interact as they're playing the game to assess team cohesion. So our first part is baselining to understand how an individual works. Then we actually um, make sure that we put together the right team. So we have different combinations of teams and then we put them through this team, uh, team problem solving using this virtual reality game in order to assess how they work together and how their relationships may or may not change over time. So we work within an analog, our, our proposal for this research is to work within an analog, um, an analog mission, and I'll explain that a little bit later as well, um, an analog mission that allows them to go through this game in different missions as time goes by. And the reason we chose this one is because it's fun. And if you're an astronaut or in the space, you are definitely a Star Trek fan, at, at least of one of the different um, versions of it. And two, these types of games aren't always used. They use virtual reality for tasks specifically or um, to help engage and measure stress, but not necessarily as a, a training tool for team cohesion and understanding that type of activity. So we wanted to make sure that we could understand team flow, which is you know where the team starts to understand shared mental models. How do they work? What are their strengths and weaknesses in um, an environment and in a task that's outside of what they're actually doing? So really trying to get them to experience each other in a different way. And then finally, because VR in and of itself gives positive experiences in a learning environment. Um, the fact that it's a Star Trek game really gets people engaged. It breaks up the monotony of what happens when you're in an analog situation because it is monotonous. You aren't, you can't go outside. You can't go and, um, visit someone else or someone different. You're gonna see the same people on and on. What we find out when we talk about um, these analog missions is that uh, people underestimate, <clears throat> excuse me, underestimate the psychological impact and importance of the work that they do. So it's really important for us to understand how individuals and how those teams work together. And another use case of virtual reality, and um, this is one of my favorite, my favorite movies, because it really puts the psychological health at the forefront of the story and not just that background to show kind of cool stuff. And that's the movie Ad Astra. So I would highly recommend that you see that because it really, if you look at all the behavioral checkpoints that happen in the movie, it's like, well, what is the technology behind that that allows a person to do a, an audio journal and then get checked for psychological health for that journal? That's in the first like five minutes. It's not a spoiler or anything, but those are the different tools that are all in this. So when we use virtual reality, it, it's used as a countermeasure. And so this is something that's a little bit different of a tool and a training for a specific person. This is specifically for someone's mental health. As we learned in the last one, you know, virtual reality can bring out a positive experience and positive emotion. Therefore, using it for mindfulness, for reduction of stress release is a value that is necessary. Because one, it takes a person out of their current environment, which is limited. The stimulus is limited because it starts to degrade because there's nothing new. Virtual reality offers that. If you've watched Star Trek, um, they have the holodeck. So there's always this entertainment and need to be 
someplace different and engage a new novel stimulus. Um, in the movie Ad Astra, it was used as stress release where this whole room changed to calm a person down. There's another um, Swedish science fiction movie called An Aniara where the whole ship starts to, um, the whole crew of this vehicle is like a cruise ship that's going to Mars. We've gotten to that point. And there was a, a room that allowed people to go and be in a different situation. It was, it's like group, it was like group um, virtual reality is very interesting use case. But the point is they had that available because they know that people are gonna need an escape. So virtual reality becomes a countermeasure and a tool that's used as a way to readjust, um, de-stress and train people or use as a tool to change their mental state and be more comfortable where they are or have an escape. And it's private. The other value of the virtual reality is that it's a private place. You don't have to share this with anyone else. Your experience is your experience. It provides a way of having um, psychological safety. And so those are the things that are important. You know, and we, I'm talking about the use in space. And of course, this whole conference has all kinds of use cases. And we have used in my other hat at the Mental Health Center of Denver is using virtual reality as part of mental health treatment in creating a space for mindfulness in group therapy. So that is really a new territory in community mental health and bringing technology for use that anybody could do. Because the other part of it is we want people to be self-reliant, self-care, understand their emotions and when they need to do something. And all of these tools are a way to do that. It gives them a way to do the escape on their own terms, understand when they need it and have a tool available to them when they, when they, um, when they need it. Another challenge of uh, going into space is that weight is important. So you can't have a lot of equipment. If you can just have a headset that does this, that's great. We are not at the place where we can build this room like an Ad Astra on the ship that we're not there yet. Not far because we know how to do it, but we just have to put the focus and effort on a way to make that happen. So what does that um, look like when we're preparing for Mars and going on these um, missions? What we use are isolation studies and or analog studies. And there's a lot of um, ones that are being used. There's there's a few in Antarctica. There's also the, the analog of being in the submarine. There's a, a NASA has a NEMO um, exploration opportunity. There is obviously going into Antarctica, but there's also desert because Mars is going to be a desert environment. We know that you saw the picture of Mars. It's red, it's grainy and it's dirt. There's no water, there's no life, at least life that we, as we know it, carbon-based life, or that may have been there, but there's not life there now. So the Mars Desert Research Station is put on by the, is sponsored by the Mars Society and individuals go out there for two weeks in isolation and, and um, conduct missions as if they are on Mars. They have the same limitations as you see them going into the, um, the habitat here they have to put on equipment if they're going out just like they were in Mars. So a lot of scientists do different um, studies on equipment use, how easy is it to use? How do people get along? Can they do certain tasks, et cetera? Another one is a human exploration research analog, which we've applied to to do research. And as you can see, and you're looking at the scale, it's not that big either. They have a hygiene module that's attached to that. And eventually as we go out into space, there'll be different modules, hopefully for different, um, like a sleeping module that'll be that size that people can go into and have a little more space than a, than a closet. But that is, um, one of our researchers was uh, a member of what they call a mission 
in the HERA group. And what we can do is do a, all of our monitoring in conditions that are, that are replicant of what it's gonna be like either going to the International Space Station. I noticed, you know, I talk about Mars because it's the, the bigger challenge in the sense that humans have only gone as far as the moon. That's as far as we've gone. We've sent robots and explorers and rovers to Mars. We've, I don't know if you saw recently or paid attention, but we had a vehicle that intersected with a, an, astro an asteroid <clears throat> that was flying and it interfaced with it, got some um, samples, some soil samples and are returning it. So we have sent robotics out ahead, but sending humans a whole different ball of wax, just because you have to keep the human physically alive and also mentally alive. And that's what these analogs are about. Um, and what you see, and I want, and the reason I use these pictures is to show you the different scale. The last one is the actual capsule that is going to Mars. So when you see that, that capsule holds four people and they're sitting um, on top of each other in the launch and there'll be modules attached to that capsule. But for the most part, for their first part of their journey, they are in that capsule and that isolation. And that's gonna be the center of what um, is going, the center of that whole vehicle in mission going to Mars. So imagine spending <coughs> your time or the majority of your time in that over three years with limited access to your family, with limited access to um, <clears throat> the mission control, you are self-reliant not only for the mission itself, but for your own physical health and mental health. Obviously there'll be uh, communications from mission control and things like that but the instantaneousness of that communication is gonna be gone. And so that puts another level of pressure to um, engage and make sure that you have everything that you need in order to survive this. And also um, what we're doing like in Deep Space Predictive is trying to find ways so you can understand your own individual um, psychological health, but also the team's psychological health and get alert when things might not be optimal for you or the team, not just optimal based on what we have said, this is what optimization is because that's gonna be very relative to what is going on in your situation because nobody knows what optimal is when you're going to Mars because no one has ever gone here. So that's another really enticing challenge of being the first is that you don't know what's out there. You don't know how people are going to react. We know how long people can survive and still maintain their physical health. We know what some of the physical health challenges are. Some of those physical health challenges are um, atrophy of your muscles. So you see a lot of pictures of um, astronauts doing, you know, jogging, they're on harnesses because we don't have gravity yet. Um, so we need people to discover gravity that will take away at least 30 to 40% of some of the problems that are encountered in space travel when you can walk. One, it's a psychological comfort because it's what you're used to. You're really going into a foreign environment in these conditions. So those are the conditions that we're going into, we, we're not building a huge ship like in Star Wars or anything like that. Those don't exist, but we're not that far away. Um, this mission is gonna happen in 2023, uh, not 2023, sorry, 2033 is a target to go to Mars and it's going to be an international effort. So now the other challenge you have are, what are cultural differences? What are the ideas and um, where do people default in their own comfort when they are not of comfort? So um, one of the famous um, analog studies was the Mars 500 where it was international. And that was an opportunity to really talk about and understand cultural differences and who are, I think there was another presentation, the in and out groups. A lot of people have talked about that, 
that really gets to be important and understand what the impact of that is in these confined spaces because who who are the leaders what happens and how do they lead when there's only four people you know two people get in a fight again like i said earlier the whole team is in a fight and so those are some really big challenges that we have to look at and so when I talked about the Mars Desert Research Crew, here is one of the crews that um, went to Mars. And what's unusual about this crew is that we have a woman who's a leader. Um, as you can see, they're young individuals. And uh, when we talk about all the research projects and one of you know, the challenges of it are, where is the end? If we know when the end of a project is or a mission is, we can kind of assess where some high and low points are gonna be. But when we go to Mars, that high and low point could be stretched, it could be repeated, we don't know. So there's this thing called the third quarter phenomenon where by the time, no matter what the mission is, when you get to that third quarter, it's the lowest point psychologically of that mission because you're starting to lose hope. You don't know when it's, when if you can continue to survive, but then as you ease into the fourth quarter, you have the end is near and therefore your emotional state goes up. But a lot of studies have said that some of, those, some of that phenomenon is true, some of it's not, but we do know that there are dips and that they're you know, at the halfway stage and the latter part of it, there's a point of risk. So what we would call a point of psychological breaking points would occur in those different areas. So that's what we try to manage as well on top is looking at the different cycles of psychological health of the crew. Um, this is a crew that went in for two weeks. They were over Christmas. And the thing is, when you do any kind of post mission debriefing, whether it's the Mars Desert Research Station, ISS, International Space Station, the high seas analog, which is a very famous one in Hawaii, this Hawaii um, uh, analog, st uh, analog system. And you, they always say, you know, everyone's always worried going in that they can't do the work or the work is gonna be the challenge. Can we do the work? Can we keep up the pace? That turns out to not be the biggest issue in this what turns out to be the biggest issue is the interpersonal relationships and the psychological impact of these crews. And I don't think people are prepared enough to do that because we're worried about safety, which is obviously a high importance. They're worried about um, making sure the human, the body itself physically survives. And so the psychological piece is addressed as stress. How do we reduce stress? How do we use VR to reduce stress? But what about the interpersonal relationships? How do we start to understand what that is and manage that? Because like anything else, those relationships um, are bound in that experience. And what we also know is people continue to live in that experience. So another analog study was um, Biosphere. I don't know if you've heard about that. That was a two year study where they were um, in an isolated environment. They had running water and everything was on earth, but by the end, it was six couples that went in. Six couples came out, but those couples have never spoken to each other since they stepped away from that biosphere, which was over 30 years ago their experience was so traumatic and so impacting that they have refused to speak to each other after that. And that can happen in some of these um, analogs and these crews. You know, we glorify the, the astronaut and all their activities and the, the camaraderie, which is there, but there's also other sides of that too. And what we wanna do at Deep Space Predictive is make sure that we give people the tools to manage through those, those harsher times, those negative times, those low points, and know that it's okay because it is a human trait and that we will give you the tools that you need to manage that. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, 
you know, making sure that we acknowledge and understand and support the human in the loop. And that's what we do at um, Deep Space Predictive. I know my time is up, so let me just, you know, go through some acknowledgements of the people that worked with us. Um, one of the things we do at Deep Space, Predict Deep Space Predictive is we have an international team, international research team. So um, Becky Inksters from Cambridge, Andrew Smith-Simmons is from Scotland, Mark Shepherds in Cambridge, Richard Adante is US. My team is based in the US, but we also have individuals who are also organizations that are international. Sabre Astronautics, as you see here, they are um, out of Australia. We have some French collaborators as well, but the whole idea is they bring in different disciplines into the work that, they do, that we do so that we have the, a whole plethora of perspectives in working with the individuals. So um, these are some of the partnerships that have worked in, in putting all of this together. So at this point, um, this is how you can reach me. And thank you for the time and thank you for the opportunity to present and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Adir. That was very, very interesting. 